What's up guys, Taiki here, and in this video I'll be going over Bancor and its native token BNT. If you like the content, please like and subscribe and leave a comment in the comment section below. So let's get started. You know, I look at projects from more of a fundamental basis because one of my greatest fears is selling too early, whether it be, you know, panic selling after a 30% dump and seeing a 20x afterwards, or even selling right after a 2x, feeling like a genius and seeing the token rip 10x. Uh, but I feel like by understanding tokens and why a project is valuable, I feel like it's easier to really hold the token and see it play out, really to you know, increase your risk reward and maximize ROI. And as a reminder, none of this is financial advice, and I actually don't own BNT tokens. Rest in peace. But rest assured, I will be buying uh, any sizable dip. Uh, this is the overview of the video. Uh, it might be a lengthy one, but I structured it in this way, just so you can fully understand why Bancor is very, very valuable. First, I'll go over you know, what it is, what the problems are in this space with regards to AMMs, and how Bancor solves those problems, and then key takeaways. So Bancor goes all the way back to 2017. It was one of the largest ICOs, raising $150 million, uh, until the unicorns came, right? And then Bancor just really fell out of favor. Uh, you can see this in the, in the price chart, you know, it was, had this crazy surge in 2018, uh, and then just like really went into the depths of despair. Um, until recently, it really surged out of nowhere, and it's, it's garnering lots of attention. And the main reason this is happening is because of Bancor V2.1, which was released in October 2020. And uh, to really understand Bancor V2.1, you have to first understand what the problems are with automated market makers. So there are two, right? First is the liquidity problem. Second is the impermanence loss problem. I'll be going over both in detail, but let's first look at the liquidity problem. Well, if you think about how current uh, automated market makers work, you know, you can basically take USDC, let's say, and swap it for ETH, right? So if I want 100,000, if I have $100,000 in USDC, I can just swap it on Uniswap to get 60 ETH, and I can do that with limited slippage. Pretty great, right? And there's limited slippage because there's a lot of liquidity uh, for this pair in particular, 250 million uh, to be exact. And why this is, is that, you know, liquidity providers, they're incentivized to provide liquidity because uh, they can basically get a share of the fees that the Uniswap generates, which is 0.3%. As you can see, in the past 24 hours, this pair generated $200,000. So, you know, if you provide lots of liquidity, you can have a share of, the, of, of these fees that you generate. But if you think about like what happens in the back end of Uniswap, for each pool, think of it as like a fishbowl, right? And there's an equal amount of USDC and ETH in it. Uh, so with uh, with this pair, there's so much liquidity that you know if you're trying to buy hundred thousand dollars of ETH with USDC, there's not going to be that much price impact. However, if you raise that to a million dollars, there's a 0.8 percent price impact, and ten million dollars is a seven percent impact, a price impact. And this this is not good for whales, right? It doesn't really matter for us. Like we're never we're never going to be buying ten million dollars of ETH with the, with the USDC. I mean, I hope I hope I can, but uh, not not right now, right? So there's these these pools are limited in in the amount of liquidity it has. So if you look at, at a more illiquid token like Rook, uh, illiquid uh, USDC Rook pair, with a hundred thousand uh, dollars, it's one and a half percent compared to you know a really low percent uh, with the USDC ETH pair. With a million dollars, it's 13%, and 10 million dollars, there's 60% slippage, right? So, you know, with smaller tokens, small to mid cap tokens, it's really impossible for like big players like whales to buy lots of, of tokens just because these pairs are very illiquid. So, you know, when asset pairs on AMMs have low liquidity, the buyer incurs negative price slippage. Not so great. But you might be thinking, you know what, like, but if, if liquidity providers can earn 0.3% fees by providing liquidity, then why doesn't like everyone do it like it just seems like a no-brainer it's free money right but you know the reason that you know the liquidity problem exists is because there's a bigger problem with impermanence loss and this is a pretty complicated topic so and i'll try to uh, keep it simple uh, but there are other videos on youtube that uh, explain like the more technical side of it but hopefully uh, this overview can uh, give you a better understanding so basically in, in a broad sense like when you provide liquidity um, but end up underperforming compared to holding the tokens uh, compared to providing liquidity. So what is this? So let's say there's this pool, right? USDC ETH, and the price of ETH is a thousand, and the price of USD is a dollar. Yep. And to look to provide liquidity, um, I decide to deposit one ETH and a thousand USDC. You know, a one-to-one -one ratio. 
And let's say, you know, this is a really new pool and there's only $10,000 or 10 ETH and $10,000 USDC. By providing one of one ETH and 1,000 USDC, I own 10% of the pool. Cool, so I get 10% of the fees that this pool generates. Pretty great. But let's say, you know, ETH like literally goes to the moon, right? Like it's just four X's out of nowhere. Like I'm super hyped, right? Like someone, oh man, like so bullish, so bullish. But the thing with uh, Uniswap and automated market makers is that um, these pools have to have maintain a one-to-one -one ratio of each token, which you know, which becomes problematic because if ETH moons in value, arbit arbitrage traders comes in and basically dumps a lot of USDC into this pool to take out ETH, just so you know this ETH USDC pool remains a one-to-one -one balance. So what ends up happening is because the pair, uh, because the ratio must be equal. After the arbitrageurs come in, there's going to be five Ethereum and twenty thousand USDC in the liquidity pool. But if you think about it, you know I originally put in one ETH and a thousand USDC, which corresponded to ten percent of the liquidity pool. But now that ten percent is only 0.5 ETH and two thousand USDC, which is still great, right? Uh, but if you think about it, if I hodled, if I just didn't provide liquidity and just kept it to myself, I would have five thousand dollars. But because I provide liquidity and this you know, rebalancing happened, uh, I now have $4,000, which is a 20% impermanence loss. I underperformed HODL by 20%, which is obviously a problem because you're just making less money than you would have. Obviously, if you, you're you going to make, you would withdraw like $5,000, sorry, $4,000 plus any fees that you generated, but most of the times it's not going to make up for their impermanence loss. And this is like a, broad generalization of like what happens the more the token moves the more impermanence loss there's going to be which is a problem because if you're bullish ETH and you put liquidity into the pair and ETH are literally 10x's because it has to be a one-to-one -one ratio it's going to balance out and you're going to own less ETH and own more of the token that moved less uh not so great so that's the impermanence loss problem but how does Bancor Bancor v2 unsolve this uh this you know after you understand the problems it becomes pretty simple to understand why Bancor is great. So Bancor allows for single-sided liquidity, right? With Uniswap and Sushi, you have to provide two pairs, like ETH and USDC, or just any two tokens, right, at an equal value. But with Bancor, you can only, you're able to only provide one token on one single side. So this is an example. I currently have my Rook staked uh, on Bancor, and Let's see. So I have roughly this much Rook on Bancor, earning $5 right now in terms of uh, earned in Rook tokens. And by providing liquidity, I'm earning around $10 in BNT rewards. Pretty great. And at the bottom right, you see that, you know, if I hold it for 100 days, I get 100% impermanence loss coverage. So if there's any impermanence loss that happens, the, bank, the Bancor protocol will cover it for me. Well, how does this happen? So this is a... a a graphic of how this happens. So let's let's assume you're providing uh, liquidity for a token TKN, and let's assume that for simplicity, the price of TKN is the same as the price of Bancor. So let's say I provide a hundred tokens, right? Then the protocol will mint a hundred BNT and provide it and deposit it into the liquidity pool. And over time, um, let's let's say I keep it in there for hundred days. Over time, the protocol will generate fees. From all the swaps that the protocol does and if i withdraw my token 100 tokens uh, 100 bnt is burnt right so it's not like the protocol is infinitely minting bnt and like pushing down the price of bnt no like bnt is minted when you deposit and bnt is burned when you withdraw and how it works is that if there's any impermanence loss so let's say there's like like a tkn goes to the moon right the protocol will take like whatever fees that they generated over the 100 days from you know the TKN BNT pool and other pools and compensate you, the liquidity provider, for any impermanence loss. So you know in the original example, let's say you know like this example, if I provide a liquidity on Uniswap, uh, I incur 20% impermanence loss. But if I did it on Bancor, as long as I kept it in there for 100 days at least, the Bancor protocol would cover the 20% impermanence loss for me. So I would. Just, if I deposit 100 tokens, no matter what happened to the price, I would get 100 back. Uh, and that's the beauty of Bancor v2.1, uh, which is really incredible. So, but also if you think about it, like if 
if the protocol is compensating for impermanence loss by you taking its fees, can't they lose money? Like, is, isn't that a possibility? Like, what if Bancor is just losing money because there's so much impermanence loss that happens on Ethereum? Well, if you take a look at this channel, uh, sorry, this, uh, this graph, it's, it's kind of hard to understand, but if you, I read more deeply into this, and basically it said that from November 17th to the first week of January, Bancor basically paid out $64,000 in impermanence loss insurance. But the protocol during that time generated $560,000 in fees, right? So yeah, their Bancor is paying people out for impermanence loss, but they're making it up for it in a large way with the fees they generate. Because, you know, if, you know, because we're, we're basically depositing our tokens for 100 days, right? Like three, that's over three months. That's a long time in the crypto world. So over time, you know, the protocol is generating so much fees that uh, it makes up for it. And it benefits both the protocol and the token holder. And you know, I took this from one site and Bancor. It's still really new, right? I mean, the Bancor V2 one was introduced in October 2020, but in the past, you know, few months, it's already uh, at around a fifth of the revenue, a uh, fifth of the fees of Sushi, and roughly eight percent of the fees on Uniswap. But over time, I think this number is going to grow and could possibly maybe overtake sushi swap one day who knows and you can see that like the total value locked on Bancor has really skyrocketed in the past few weeks um, in the first of january i mean no much not much liquidity but as people caught on to it i mean everyone is depositing uh on Bancor. even myself like i'm bullish on rook and i and i you know plan to hold it for you know many months and maybe all of 2021 so instead of just letting it sit there, I might as well just earn a yield on it. And if Bancor can provide impermanence loss protection, it's a no-brainer. And you know, and this is the data to prove it. And this is a tweet uh, by Wingarian um, that just takes a look at the relative valuations of Bancor compared to uh, other DEXs and AMMs. A little outdated, like five days old, but you can see that you know Bancor is still undervalued. Um, it's really new. Uh, a lot of people are putting money in it, but you know, there's there's real possibility for Bancor to be like a liquidity vacuum, right? You know, why provide liquidity on Sushi or Uni when you can just provide liquidity on Bancor and get impermanence loss coverage? So in summary, um, it Bancor provides a liquidity provide uh, LP solution for hodlers. You know, if you're trying to swing trade a token for like two weeks, Bancor is not for you. But if you're in crypto for the long run and you intend on holding tokens for over 100 days. Just put it on Bancor. Like you don't even have to like buy another token to provide a liquidity oh, with a one-to-one -one ratio. Single-sided single-sided liquidity uh, is really really innovative. And with a hundred-day a uh, hundred-day impermanence loss insurance, it's gonna basically the TVL, the total value locked up on Bancor, is gonna increase. And yeah, it really benefits hodlers, right? It's not gonna benefit traders. Like it really benefits people that plan on holding assets for the longer term. And the token model really generates revenues for the protocol. You would think that they would have to pay out a lot of fee, a, a, lot, of, uh, a, a, a lot of money for providing uh, insurance for impermanence loss. But as we saw from a few slides ago, they're just making up so much money over the 100 days from the different token pairs. And that's you know the main reason that the Bancor token, the BNT token, has really risen in value, and I think it's there's so much room to run. Um, and I saw this at five dollars, and as I was you know preparing these slides to make this video, which took over a few days, I mean now it's at around nine dollars, right? I I feel the FOMO, but you know, I'm gonna try to wait for the dip, hopefully. And you know, I guess I wanna the the last takeaway that I want you to have from this video. Um, is I think about you know liquidity providing uh, LP uh, and like a, like a fishbowl right like with like with Uniswap it's and Sushi uh, it's like a one to one ratio of you know two tokens and with Uni there's a lot of you know, tiny fishbowls right some are larger than others but you know, there's a bunch of fishbowls uh, that you know you can swap tokens from but with Bancor you know it's like one giant fishbowl. Uh, just because it's a single side liquidity and the protocol mints BNT on the other side, it basically allows us to have a much bigger fishbowl with so much liquidity that allows for little slippage. And with little slippage, you know, yield aggregators like One Inch, like Matcha, 
they might use VNT or Bancor uh, to facilitate swaps, which is only going to generate more fees for the protocol. Bancor, you know, still relatively new. I mean, they're an old project, but you know what they're doing uh, with their new version V21 is pretty new. And I don't think the market fully understands it yet. So I think there's a lot of alpha to be had by watching this video and really understanding uh, the protocol. You know, I think there's, I, I think BNT can go up a lot more. Uh, so, you know, none, none of this is financial advice, obviously. And like, I don't even own BNT tokens. So I don't know why I'm shilling it. Like I, I'm hoping for a dip, but uh, that's, you know, that's the conclusion of this video. I think Bancor is truly a dark horse uh, in the AMM slash DEX uh, space. And I think there's so much potential for it to be a liquidity dark hole. And yeah, liquidity dark hole. Uh, so if you like the content, please like and subscribe. Um, you know this this video took many days to make, uh, and you know if you can provide any positive like like positive comments uh, and positive reinforcement, like your support basically incentivizes me to make these videos, and I really enjoy making these videos because you know like formatting like making a slide like like this it forces me to understand the project better, and by doing so, you know if if bank if I buy Bancor like I'm gonna have like diamond hands and strong hands with high conviction. So yeah, uh, thank you for watching and have a nice day.